Well, welcome everyone to see uh, the Center for International Security and Cooperation's weekly research seminar. Uh, we're located here at Stanford University. Uh, my name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the Interim Director for the Social Sciences at uh, CSAC. Uh, it's my pleasure to host today a seminar by two of our pre-doctoral fellows uh, entitled Technology and International Security from Interstate Influence Operations and Techno to Technological Revolutions and the Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Our speakers today are um, Jeffrey Ding, uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford, who focuses on how technological change affects the rise and fall of great powers. Um, he is also uh, an affiliate uh, and pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford's um, Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, Institute. Um, on the panel, he is joined by Josh Goldstein, who is a PhD candidate and Clarendon Scholar in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. He is also a fellow with the Stanford Internet Observatory, as well as being associated with CSAC. He, uh, his work takes a multi-method approach to studying the challenges that democracies face from uh, influence operations, and today he'll be talking about uh, um, cyber technology enabled influence operations uh, among uh, other aspects of his work. I'm not going to dwell too much more on the introductions since we have two speakers and uh, we have an hour, uh, but please keep in mind you can enter questions for the speakers at any time in the Q&A function uh, of Zoom. Um, and without much further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Ding, who will be speaking first, followed by Josh uh, Goldstein. Thank you, Harold. Uh Really great to be here uh, with you all for the CSAC seminar. It's really, especially since we'll be rooming together next year, hopefully. So hopefully the part of uh, this will be foreshadowing of great collaborations to come. This talk will be based on my dissertation, The Rise and Fall of Great Technologies and Powers. So I think what GPT-3 demonstrates, and by coincidence, uh, the, the acronyms, the acronym GPT uh, can also stand in for the concept of a general purpose technology. And that's what my argument is based on, um, that some technologies like AI, like electricity, like the steam engine um, have, are, are different from others in their ability to significantly boost productivity growth in the way in which they're able to spread across a wide range of applications. And understanding that process of GPT diffusion is essential um, to understand how technological change affects economic power transitions. Now, of course, GPT-3 can't do everything. Like, I, I, it can't write PhD dissertations. Um, believe me, I've tried to, to do that. Um, but it does speak to how understanding the effects of emerging technologies like AI will require also understanding the process of GPT diffusion. So, when we talk about technological change and the rise and fall of great powers, it's almost standard and accepted that there's some connection between a major round of technological revolution and a change in the economic leadership of the global system. These are statements from Chinese president Xi Jinping. Uh, his statement was made at a forum, a BRICS forum back in 2018. And the quote from Vladimir Putin, Putin was actually made to uh, Russian school children back in 2017. And of course, the final quote on the slide um, is from the inspiration for my, uh, for the name of my thesis, uh, Paul Kennedy's work on the rise and fall of great powers. And I'm going to be focused specifically on the mechanism between technological change and differentials and growth rates. So the first part of that quote, there's a lot of great work that has been done and to be done on the, the next part, which is how a shift in the global economic balance then affects political and military uh, strength. But I'm going to be focusing on the first part, differentials in technological change and growth and economic growth rates. In other words, the ability of a great power to sustain economic growth at higher rates than their rivals. So what is the standard argument, the received wisdom um, for answering this question? I categorize it as the leading sector theory, and it's been underpinned by a lot of scholars, Gilpin, Kennedy, Modelsky, and Thompson. And they argue that one country dominates the key innovations in leading sectors. These are new, fast-growing industries 
um, that grow up around a major technological breakthrough. Uh, so for example, cotton textiles or the steel industry um, after Bessemer's uh, innovation. Uh, these, are, these are sort of the classical leading sectors. And this work has, is, is not only influential in academic circles, um, but it's also become a standard template for policymaking. I, I bolded the TELUS et al site, Ashley TELUS and a group of scholars at Rand Corporation. Um, they wrote a report on measuring power in a post-industrial age. And it basically includes graphs, arguments from Medelsky and Thompson's work and very much adheres to the leading sector template. TELUS has written in a 2013 article that to understand US-China competition in emerging technologies, the US must maintain its monopoly on leading sector innovation. There's prominent examples that we think of, especially Germany's mastery of the chemical industry that often appears in a lot of academic work. And Dresner sums it up best when uh, he summarizes how technology affects the rise and fall of great powers in this statement. Now I wanna dig deeper into what I'm actually arguing against because I'm gonna present a, a, a different mechanism. And to explain that I wanna describe leading sector theory in the language of product cycle, of the product cycle model, which um, builds from work by Raymond Vernon, uh, where he is trying to build a model of how firms take product innovations and gain benefits from international trade. So in the product cycle, the firm initially produces this innovation, gets profits from sales in the domestic market. Then the next step, um, it markets this new product innovation to the foreign market, international market. Um, over time, foreign competitors uh, are able to grasp how to build this new product. And that becomes routinized and moves to other countries. And you see from the quotes from some of the classic leading sector works uh, where um, they have taken this product cycle method and applied it to technologies and the rise and fall of uh, national economies. And don't, don't just take my word for it, uh, right? So James Kurth in a 1976 international organization article basically makes that exact comparison. Uh, Robert Gilpin's famous work, War and Change in International Politics, takes the concept of the price cycle, applies it to national economies. So I wanna, I wanna put forward an alternative explanation for how technology affects the rise and fall of great powers. And it's basically a two-part um, theory. The first is GPTs are different, not only from other technologies, but also from leading sectors. Um, now, there is some overlap. Leading sector theories do mention electricity. They mention chemicals. Um, but for example, steel or cotton textiles under are not GPTs under my theory. Um, GPTs are defined by pervasive ap applicability, um, great potential for continual improvement and strong technological synergies. And historically they have been engines of productivity growth. And they can be inspired by uh, even small industries that don't grow particularly fast. Um, so there are some GPTs that are that are not going to be leading sectors. Like I'll talk later in the talk about um, machine tools and machine tools are never mentioned among leading sectors, but they did underpin this diffuse, gradual and broad trajectory of technological change. The second component of my theory, as I've alluded to, um, that differs from leading sectors is um, a focus on diffusion, um, not just on who creates the first demonstration of a new technology, but about who applies it uh, in a more broad and deep way. And because I focus on GPTs, diffusion matters much, much more um, because GPTs take two, um, at least three decades uh, to make their mark to actually impact economic productivity. And so um, this process of diffusion adoption um, matters much more at the technological frontier because all these advanced countries are gonna have some of the leading firms. No one country is gonna dominate innovation in this sort of like foundational type of technology. It's like no one country is gonna dominate new breakthroughs in AI or electricity. So it's more about, are you able to imitate, copy and adapt other countries' innovations in a better way? So we, what we have is the same cause, a technological revolution, major technological breakthroughs, and the same outcome, 
an economic power transition. One great power is able to sustain productivity growth at higher rates than their rivals, but two very, very different pathways. And I've isolated three dimensions of that in terms of time frame of impact, key phase of relative advantage, and breadth of growth, which is what I just isolated in the previous slide. I'm not going to talk about institutional complementarities. Um, that's sort of the second part of my argument. We just don't have time in the panel setting for that, um, but I'm happy to um, talk about it in the Q&A. But the nutshell of that is once you've established two different technological trajectories between leading sector product cycles versus GPT diffusion, um, those two different technological trajectories demand different institutional responses. Whereas the former demands cornering all the innovations in leading sectors, the latter focuses more on widening the skill base to diffuse GPTs more successfully. So here's how I'm gonna uh, tackle this question of, of setting these two mechanisms against each other. Uh, I selected three historical case studies. All of them are ones that, that leading sector scholars point to. They're most likely cases for that theory. Uh, new industries like electrical equipment, steel, cotton textiles, they emerge early on in these different periods. So it pre presents the best chance for the leading sector mechanism to succeed. Um, and two of the cases are typical cases. So you have the cause and you have the outcome. Uh, the exception is the Japan case. Um, there was all this talk about Japan being number one in the 1980s, 1990s, um, but an economic power transition never occurs. Japan is not able to sustain productivity growth at a higher rate than the US. And I use that as a deviant case. So I just, the, the sources are secondary accounts, some primary accounts from uh, contemporary trade journals, um, but mostly, I think the key value add here is that a lot of our field defining works um, were written bef before um, some of these new materials came out about cleometrics, applying statistics and econometrics to the study of um, how the historical impact of technologies and also we can benefit from new data sets such as the cross country historical adoption of technology data set. So I'm only gonna talk about one case just to flesh out how I'm testing um, the theory. And I'll give a little background on the second industrial revolution first. Uh, this is from 1870 to 1930 as the temporal bounds. I, it's, it's important because it's a key reference point for present day discussions. We see that in academic works that call back to Germany's dominance of chemicals, as I mentioned early, earlier, but we also see that in sort of like the tagline, AI is the new electricity. Um, and uh, anybody who studies the effects of AI on international politics um, has come across this term and it's sort of this callback to, to this period. So we have the cause and the outcome both present. I listed some of the key innovations there. Economic historians have said there was no period greater in scientific um, innovations in terms of the density of scientific innovations uh, than 18, 1859 to 1874. Um, we also have the outcome. We have this shift from the UK as the undisputed economic hegemon to the US and Germany challenging that status. And I think a key argument for this case is I'm gonna be focusing on the US. Um, a lot of the international relations literature and the power transitions literature focuses on Germany, I think in part because of World War I, right? Um, but if we're talking strictly about who was the actual economic leader, it was the US um, that really rose to that mantle. And you see this with data on per capita GDP um, and, and the choice of different productivity indicators and the focus on productivity and economic efficiency overall uh, is driven by recent work by Beckley, uh, Anders et al. and International Studies Quarterly that, that, that have derived kind of better indicators of economic power based on uh, per capita GDP and surplus economic power. And you see very clearly it's the US that overtakes Britain. Uh, before World War I. So when I pit, a, pit the leading sector product cycle approach against GPT diffusion in the second industrial revolution, um, I take those same points of differences, the three dimensions, impact time frame, key phase of relative advantage, breadth of growth, um, and you, we can derive different sets of predictions. Um, so for the Leading sector mechanism, they focus on chemicals, electrical equipment, automobile and steel industries. Note that the focus is on these new industries, capturing monopoly profits from these new industries 
um, from cornering all the exports um, from these new industries. And there is some overlap with the GPT mechanism, with, which focuses more on these underlying processes. But, but there are key differences, right? The GPT mechanism doesn't look to the steel industry, um, whereas the leading sector me mechanism doesn't talk about the, this process of interchangeable manufacture, um, which was how um, manufacturing processes uh, became more precise and more standardized. Um, and um, that was driven in part by uh, innovations in machine tools, as I mentioned earlier. And what this came to be called the American system of manufacture. Um, so so there, there is some overlap, but there are also distinct differences in the technological drivers. Uh, but where the differences really get fleshed out is on how these technologies actually impacted differences in economic growth. So for the leading sector mechanism, uh, we'll have different predictions about the timeframe of the impact, generally earlier. We'll, we'll, we should focus on Germany's monopoly on innovation, and we should see technological growth and property advance driven by a concentrated set of leading sectors. We see the opposite for the GPT mechanism. One thing to note is that interchangeable manufacture, um, the key innovations came earlier in the, in the mid 1850s, and the incremental changes happened in, uh, to, to extend interchangeable manufacture um, in the second industrial revolution period. So we should see actually that the, that electricity and chemicals make their greatest impact after World War I, but that machine tools and interchangeable manufacture make their greatest mark during this period. So uh, let's go through each of the dimensions. Um, on the delayed timelines front, I'm just gonna focus on chemicals and electricity. Um, see that, yes, there is German dominance in global dye stuffs. So synthetic dyes are this major new industry uh, because of chemical innovations. Uh, but actually chemical industry growth rates take off after 1913 and chemicals definitely cannot explain the US, right? The US is behind Germany, late to establish industrial research labs. Only seven American dye makers, um, they don't derive a lot of exports. Britain has more exports from chemicals um, in 1913 than the US. And we see a similar story for electrification. Um, and that's actually the classic case in economic history where electricity as a GPT takes 40 years to diffuse um, until we actually see effects on productivity growth. So what is left in terms of the key timings? Uh, the key timings then are one potential leading sector in the steel industry, and then also the machine tools trajectory that I talked about earlier. And you have the significant breakthroughs in machine tools, and it's in 1880 where there are torrential proportions of machine tools diffusing across American industry. And now, equally for the leading sector, there is a convincing case to be made for steel. So we'll keep that in mind as we go through the other dimensions. I look at the clustering of different innovations, looking at lists of major innovations, and to what extent US firms were the first to introduce these innovations. And you also see for Britain, they came up with many of the key electrical innovations. Uh, the steam turbine was crucial to spreading electricity um, and helping central utilities develop, uh, but they fell behind in the practical application across the entire nation. And I also tackle this idea of like crude steel output being so important in terms of the US and Germany gaining on Britain, uh, whereas there was actually two different steel industries being built uh, being that diverged in this period. Uh, more higher quality steel Britain specialized in. So actually a lot of the German exports of steel were exported to Britain where they were reprocessed into higher qualities of steel. So what does that leave us? It leaves us with the, this, the relative phase of advantage. Uh, is it innovation? No, it's actually the diffusion of machine tools uh, as you see from the machine intensity metrics, as you see from reports from study commissions from Great Britain to the US where they talk about this widespread adaptation of machine tools across US industry. And again, in the breadth of growth, which is the last dimension, uh, based on productivity growth statistics, qualitative accounts of how machine tools were the transmission center, uh, we see how uh, it, it was a broad-based uh, growth. I can come back to chemical engineering the questions, but I wanna leave Josh uh, his time, so I'll skip to the conclusion now. Some other pieces that I meant, didn't mention was the technological institutional complementarities where I introduced, which, which I talked about in the theory section. Uh, the other cases largely bear out um, sort of some sort of the findings we see in the second industrial revolution case. 
Um, and uh, this is how I see the project contributing to not just the academic research, but uh, implications for technology policy and how we study the broader causal um, effects of technological change on international politics overall. Uh, so thanks for the time and uh, I'll turn it over to Josh. Um, first, thanks everybody for taking the time to come and listen to uh, our presentations. I'm gonna talk about one of my three dissertation papers, um, which is titled Foreign Influence Operations and International Security Studies. And the goal of the paper is to orient the security studies field to the subject of influence operations and to argue that the topic warrant warrant more attention in security studies. This is a work in progress paper, so I definitely appreciate any feedback people have. If you want to add comments to uh, the chat or the q and I, I would appreciate comments in addition to questions. In his recent book on active measures, Thomas Ridd describes how the KGB and East German foreign intelligence deployed a series of influence operations to shape the anti-nuclear and global peace movements. The leader of the Generals for Peace movement a movement of former NATO generals for disarmament was a Stasi agent of influence. Moscow used front organizations to push the slogan, no new missiles in Europe, accepting by implication recently deployed Soviet SS-20 medium range missiles in Europe while opposing US modernization efforts. Although influence operations gained significant public attention after Russia's interference in the 2016 US election, they've long been used as a tool of statecraft. From Benjamin Franklin printing fake newspaper cutouts in France, in the 1770s to German and British influence operations during World War II, or the US running covert radio broadcasting during the Vietnam War. Influence operations are a tool of statecraft that have been used in peace and war by democracies and autocracies alike. Today, we've seen social media influence operations go global. So the Disinfodex project tracks public removals of inauthentic networks of accounts by Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and has more than 256 distinct networks from 2018 to date in its data set. You can find these on disinfodex.org, I believe, but, or just Google Disinfodex project. These are publicly accessible. Since each of these networks can be used for multiple influence operations, and since these only include the networks that the platforms found and announced, it's likely a significant undercount of the total number of social media influence operations during this time period. A recent report from the Oxford Internet Institute depicts the source and target state of 2020 takedowns. Each line here represents an operation targeting a particular country. So I've highlighted uh, Russia and Iran as uh, very common sources of these operations on Facebook targeting a very diverse set of countries. Why should we care about influence operations? There are two sort of categories of reasons. The first is that they could have first order effects. So influence operations could change people's attitudes or behaviors about a topic, or they could change the information that's prevalent about a topic. So it could make people more hesitant to express their views if their views contradict with what seems like the dominant view because of an influence campaign. There are also second order effects. This includes undermining faith in democratic institutions and elections, eroding common knowledge, and stirring paranoia. Uh, we see this in the United States today when there are often allegations of Russian influence operations on a whole bunch of different subjects, even before there's strong evidence to prove that that's the case. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to track my dissertation paper, uh, Foreign Influence Operations and International Secu Security Studies. Influence operations, a term that's used in policy and by intelligence practitioners, but it's not well-defined and it's pretty under-theorized in international relations and security studies literatures. So I'll spend a good portion of time laying out the concept, explaining why it's prevalent, and then I'll conclude with a few reflections on what security studies can gain from studying the subject and where future research could go from here. In 1990, CIA analyst Richard Shehuer wrote, there's no agreement as to what is encompassed by the term influence operations. In the years since, that hasn't changed. Influence operations are elusive to define, and terms related to information manipulation are often used with little consistency. In my paper, I propose a definition and construct it in component parts, trying to make clear what an influence operation is and where the boundaries lie. So I define influence operations as covert informational efforts intended to affect attitudes or opinions in a manner favorable to the perpetrator. The first criterion is that influence operations are covert, and this is sort of the crux of the definition. It places influence operations within the broader framework of covert action, operations which are planned and executed in a way that hides true sponsorship, and that if uncovered, 
are designed such that the sponsor can plausibly claim deniability. So there's a whole literature in international relations on covert action, which mostly focuses on kinetic forms of covert action, like supporting regime change, not non-kinetic forms of covert action, like informational uh, actions or influence operations. So how can an influence operation be covert? I suggest that an actor can hide its identity or its relationship with an operation in a few different ways. In covert identity, actors hide or obfuscate the identity of the person or entity conveying information. For example, I worked with a CSAC colleague, Lindsay Hundley, and studied a network of Twitter accounts that were removed from the platform for foreign interference. The accounts were operated from Iran and tweeted during the first US 2020 presidential debate, pretending to be Americans. One such account here uh, was named Alexis, but had a profile picture of the actress Piper Perabo. In covert coordination, actors spreading information attempt to appear independent when they're in fact working in concert. So our team at the Stanford Internet Observatory recently studied a, a network on Facebook from the Central African Republic. The network included many pages which appeared as independent media outlets or NGOs, but they were in fact highly coordinated. So here I have an example of uh, multiple of the pages sharing an identical post, even though they pretended to be independent. In covert sourcing, an actor attempts to hide how they obtained information they spread or to use false sources, even if the identity of the proximate communicator is transparent. This is often the case in narrative laundering operations, when a story is planted and then legitimized through repetition across other media entities. Today, we see state-affiliated online outlets cite fake social media personas. So here's an example of a fake persona writing for a GRU front, the Inside Syria Media Center. These stories are sometimes then cited as evidence by other Russia-affiliated outlets, while concealing the original source was a fake persona. Finally, in covert sponsorship, actors hide or obfuscate the relationship between the proximate source of information and a sponsor guiding that activity. In the Cold War, uh, states often use front organization to push messages that benefit them. In 2016, the Russian Internet Research Agency promoted an in-person rally in Texas across from an Islamic cultural center, which in turn inspired a counter rally. People attending the rally didn't know though that the Internet Research Agency ran Facebook ads to promote the event or that they contacted potential organizers. So here's just a, a summary table of some of the different ways that operations, influence operations can be covert, along with examples of the types of behaviors that intelligence practitioners or intelligence historians have sort of classically considered to be influence operations. So running agents of influence often aligns with covert identity, forging documents with covert sourcing, coordinated media campaigns with covert coordination. And these different forms of covert behavior can be used either independently or in conjunction. Why opt for the covert route? States could opt for the covert route or take op operational security measures to hide their identity for one of two reasons. First is operational effectiveness, to increase the likelihood that the target is persuaded by the information. The second is to limit political repercussions when spreading false or unpopular information. Repercussions like potential escalation from a target state, reputational backlash, or the perception of violating international norms. And these justifications build out of, are built out of the kinetic covert action literature. So I've talked a lot about the covert criterion, which helps to distinguish, distinguish influence operations from uh, overt activity like public diplomacy or overt propaganda. Influence operations are also informational, which distinguishes them from other forms of kinetic covert action like clandestine attacks or assassination. And they're designed to affect opinion, which distinguishes influence operations from other covert informational efforts like espionage or intellectual property theft. My definition of influence operations suggests that they're not exclusive to international relations. So they could be used by businesses trying to influence public opinion or smear a competitor. Uh, they could also be used by governments, departments or agencies against their own domestic public. For example, Twitter found that the Royal Thai Army ran fake Twitter accounts to cheerlead for the army while targeting domestic Thai Twitter users. But the international security studies community is particularly interested in a subset of influence operations, those that are foreign and political in nature. When defining a term that's already in use, one key question is whether it captures the relevant political phenomena that intuitively belong. So in this case, the, the types of operations that intelligence historians or practitioners have considered to be influence operations. 
And I believe that a broad definition better captures these phenomena than some narrower definitions in literature. For example, definitions that specify that influence operations are necessarily used by authoritarians or necessarily against an opponent or used to cause harm fail to capture examples like British influence operations targeting the United States uh, in World War II, which included a smear campaign against an, isol an isolationist congressman and uh, using front organizations. So this wasn't uh, an authoritarian, it wasn't used against an opponent and the perpetrator likely wouldn't have thought they were causing harm but it does intuitively belong in the category of influence operations. Likewise, definitions that specify that influence operations spread false information fail to capture that today, most of the content spread by covert actors is not false. It's non-falsifiable or it's partisan. In the next section of my paper, I ask, why should security studies scholars care about influence operations now? One reason is because they're prevalent and they're likely to remain so. I argue they're prevalent and likely to remain so for a few reasons. I'll focus on two in the presentation. First is that they're cost effective. And the second is that they're difficult to deter. One reason why influence operations are relatively cheap is because of the rising costs of war. Andrew Krepinevich traces military revolutions for how war is fought over time. The railroad and telegraphs sustaining combat in World War I, uh, combustion engines and radio and radar allowing for the Blitzkrieg in World War II, such that over time, war has become more destructive. Furthermore, the potential benefits of war have decreased with the rise of a knowledge-based economy. So controlling new land isn't as directly associated with economic and political power, and it's difficult to extract wealth from a knowledge-based economy through conquest alone. At the same time, there's been a significant decline in the cost of reaching foreign publics. The democratization of the news has made it such that anyone can publish news or opinion at no or low cost driving up the number of voices that weigh in on politics. When new legitimate blogs and news sites pop up every day, it becomes very easy to hide in their midst. The creation of social media giants, Facebook and Twitter in 2006 and 2007 respectively, has also given direct access to mass publics in foreign countries that don't effectively block their use. States don't need to place agents of influence in foreign countries years in advance. They can pose as ordinary social media users and set up networks of accounts rather quickly. Influence operations are also cheap because of the ease of outsourcing to PR and marketing firms. In 2020, Facebook and Twitter attributed at least 15 operations to these kinds of private firms. Outsourcing allows governments to forego the startup costs of hiring and training propagandists in the tactics of contemporary social media and to sidestep the inefficiencies of government bureaucracies. Instead, it allows governments to rely on market pricing for their disinformation needs. Darren Linville and Patrick Warren from Clemson University write in their 2020 lawfare piece that the internet research agency's monthly budget to execute its campaign around the 2016 US presidential election cost $1.25 million per month. The cost of a single B-21 bomber shown left is said to be more than $550 million. And I quote now from their piece, considering that Russia has a gross domestic product smaller than that of some US states, it's clear which battle space Kremlin will likely choose to compete in. And the same is likely true for other nations. Another reason why influence operations are an attractive tool is because foreign publics may be prone to overreact to the news of influence operations that fall along partisan lines. When an operation favors the opposing candidate or policies that somebody doesn't like, they're more likely to think it's a big deal. Politicians also have incentives to claim that there are foreign influence operations targeting them even if the evidence is not yet well established. The DFR Labs Interference Tracker Project found 84 allegations of foreign interference originating from 18 nations in the lead up to the 2020 election. These stories received more than 29 million social media shares and engagements. So Americans worry about foreign interference indicates to foreign propagandists that they've been successful and in turn encourages, encourages them to wage further operations. Another reason why influence operations are prevalent is because they're difficult to deter, both by denial and by punishment. It's difficult to deter influence operations by denial because there are so many different ways to reach a target audience. And I borrow here a slide from Rene Dresta's Black Hat talk. There are social media, broadcast media, fake news sites, traditional media in a target state. These potential information dissemination channels each represent unique vulnerabilities. So it's difficult for states to deter influence operations by denial, 
because it would require building defenses on each dissemination channel described here, many of which are not controlled by the government. This is part of why people describe the whole of society approach that's necessary to combat influence operations. Like in the case of cyber attacks, it's often difficult to attribute an influence operation to a specific actor, particularly when they go to great lengths to conceal their identity. So it's difficult to threaten retaliation if you can't necessarily uncover the source. Even when attribution can be made to a foreign government directly, governments and researchers risk compromising their sources and methods should they seek to hold the foreign perpetrator accountable. Because to prove that a foreign adversary is behind an attack, you have to provide evidence. But this evidence provides insight into how the identity of the operation was attributed, which allows propagandists to update their tactics in the future, leading to a sort of cat and mouse game. In addition to the attribution problem, it could be difficult to deter by retaliation when states want to avoid escalation. For example, David Chimer argues that the Obama administration knew about Russian efforts to influence public opinion on social media in 2016, but they chose not to retaliate out of fear that the Kremlin would in turn escalate their behavior and actually manipulate votes. So I'll briefly touch on two implications for security studies. The first is that traditional notions of power in international relations conform to what Joseph Nye has described as hard power. It's the ability of a, a country to get what it wants through coercion or payment, and it depends on a country's military and economic prowess. But Dahl wrote that my intuitive idea of power is something like this. A has power over B to the extent that he can get B to do something that B would otherwise not do. If states can get foreign citizens to think or act differently than they otherwise would, then this is a form of power that doesn't directly correlate with the state's geography, wealth, or troops. This calls greater attention to the need for security studies to consider types of power that are neither hard power nor soft power, the power of attraction. Second, standard model models in international relations, such as Allison's three models and Putnam's two-level game, conceive of the domestic and international interactions, the boards as distinct. But influence operations challenge that these boards are as disconnected as they appear. Foreign leaders through influence operations can influence the domestic board, independent of the domestic leader. I labeled this pathway C. Pathway C can affect the public's threat perception, which alters the leader's decision-making calculus. And this matters for core topics of international security. So if leader B can get public A's, can affect public A's threat perception of country B, it could diminish the likelihood of an arms race. Or if leader B can increase the threat perception of a common enemy, it could potentially increase the likelihood of A and B forming an alliance. So to conclude, uh, for a few areas where security studies could, could contribute or um, both research I'm working on and that other people are working on and hope to see more of, one is how to think about the effectiveness of influence operations and how to measure the effectiveness of influence operations. So in the second dissertation paper, which I didn't talk about here, I explore how people are impacted by peer and elite cues, with the idea being that uh, influence operations on social media often take the form of pretending to be peers of uh, your target. So I'm looking at to what extent do peer influences actually change people's foreign pro policy preferences. Second, how do citizens respond to allegations of foreign interference or foreign influence operations? Um, this builds on recent work by Mike Toms and Jessica Weeks and uh, unpacks the second order effects. So not just do people change their views about a particular operation, but um, does it change people's views about the news or about the uh, trustworthiness of elections? So I'm looking at how people uh, respond to allegations of foreign influence operations when there's uncertainty around the allegation. Uh, work in security studies could look at variation in state usage. So why do certain countries wage certain types of influence operations compared to others? Or what explains why certain states are more inclined to use influence operations by others than others? And lastly, how will new technologies affect this landscape? So I'm working right now on a team um, with partners across Stanford University studying how uh, GPT-3 or similar AI uh, language generating technologies might be used by propagandists in the future. So two questions uh, to wrap up here. If people have any uh, feedback on the definition that I laid out, if you found it convincing or not, if it's you find it over or under inclusive, are there other caveats or criteria to consider? Um, I'd really appreciate that feedback either in the Q&A or um, if you want to reach out to me directly.
Um, and also, are there other aspects to consider in a concept building paper that I didn't include in the presentation? And here is uh, my contact information for anybody who'd like to get in touch. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have about uh, 15, 17 minutes for Q&A. Um, so I'll be reading some from the chat. Uh, by tradition, we usually start with our CSAC pre and postdoctoral fellows. Um, so let me start with a question from um, uh, Jack, uh, Jill Hazelton, uh, visiting scholar and professor at the Naval War College. Um, she says, you identify two different first order effects, Josh, in your presentation. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the difference between them? And are you saying that there's a causal relationship between the two or not? So I, I wasn't suggesting there's a causal relationship between the two, but there's sort of variants on um, how you could impact somebody's opinion about a topic. So one is you could persuade them um, and they could actually change their view as a result of information that comes through in an influence operation. And I think that's the first, um, first order effect I talked about. But then even if somebody doesn't change their opinion about uh, a particular policy, for example, Another kind of first order effect that I was putting out there is that if you change the information environment enough, they might, people might think that they're in a, um, a minority, for example, or they might feel afraid to express their opinion, which can have an effect on the way that people discuss a particular topic. Even if that person doesn't change their own view, it could change the views of others or um, change their perception of public opinion. Uh, thanks. Um... Uh, and another question for um, uh, you, uh, Josh. Uh, Stephen Bono asks, um, I agree that foreign influence operations should have a broader rather than narrower definition. But let's take that a step further. Why should they necessarily be covert? Communist governments in Europe worried as much about the Voice of America broadcast during the Cold War as US officials worry about clandestine groups today. They also worried about American music groups and their influence on public attitudes. Uh, can we fairly define rock music as a foreign influence operation? So um, th this is a really good question. And I don't mean to imply that um, overt propaganda efforts don't have an effect or aren't more important than um, covert efforts. All I'm trying to imply in this definition is that, or what I'm trying to do in building this definition is um, set a boundary around covert efforts, which might operate on logics which are distinct from more overt efforts um, like you described in Voice of America. So um, I talked about two reasons why states might wanna pursue covert efforts, one being operational effectiveness. So it could be that um, information is less credible when it comes from um, an overt American source than when the US government tries to either um, put out the information in an unattributable way or attribute it to a false source. So setting influence operations as covert um, allows us to try to unpack why do states pursue covert action instead of overt action um, and to study a set of activities from that are have been typically run by intelligence organizations. Um, so the I guess just to, to sort of recap a long answer, um, I am not implying that overt operations can't have an impact. I'm just saying that um, we can subset influence operations in the way that they've typically been considered by intelligence um, historians or practitioners as a subset of active measures, which are covert, um, and study potentially the difference between covert and overt kinds of operations. Thanks. Um, I actually had a question for Jeff. Um, and uh, this looks at this, um, I, I wanted you to connect back to the beginning of your presentation where you talked about AI and general purpose technologies. And you implied that a lot of the effects in your talk, if I understood you correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you tend to see the effects of general purpose technologies later in after a, long, uh, uh, a relatively long period of time after their introduction. Uh, that's when they diffuse out, they become commonly used. So if you were looking at AI today, what kind of indicators do you think would be useful to kind of tell them apart uh, the, in terms of AI being something that looks more like a general purpose technology versus something explained more by the product uh, lifecycle? Um, 
uh, uh, and sort of what kind of indicators would you look for to, to really uh, confirm that this is a GPT? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it speaks to an issue for uh, scholars who rely on the GPT concept in the sense of how to empirically identify them. Uh, so uh, previous efforts have looked at patent data to see if uh, certain technological domains versus others are more likely to have patents that get cited um, by other technological domains. So for narrow industries, the citation pattern for a patent uh, will probably stay within that industry or within that technological domain. Uh, but for a technology like AI, a general purpose technology, um, patents uh, that are related to AI will likely have a much broader generality in terms of the different technological classes that are citing those patents. Uh, so uh, one of the pieces uh, that I just linked in the slideshow, um, when I talk about the effects of electricity, um, Sergio Petralia has published a 2020 article in research policy that basically takes different patent metrics and tries to analyze uh, the GPT-ness of different technological classes. Um, and so in his study from 2000 to 2010, um, he ranked like the top 10 classes. And one of the ones in that top 10 was um, image analysis. And uh, that connects back to AI because uh, that was one of the major advances that ushered in this new revolution of deep learning was um, using deep learning to analyze a really, really large data set of images called ImageNet. And, and that sort of sparked this new trajectory of um, computer vision, which can be used in a variety of applications from consumer applications to using computer vision to spot defects on the production line. Um, so those are some of the indicators I'd point you to. Great. Um, let me give you one more question, Jeff, uh, and then I have another one for Josh. Um, uh, Gilly Vardy, a historian here at Stanford, says, thank you for a great talk. Uh, regarding the rise of um, great powers, you mentioned that adoption rather than invention is, a, is the key factor. But what are the dynamics shaping adoption? Are they similar in cases, different cases like steel, electricity, et cetera? Um, so if you could speak to the adoption uh, uh, mechanism. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, uh, the factors that shape which country is the first to innovate, the first to bring a new technological innovation to market, um, overlap with the factors that shape which country uh, also becomes the diffusion leader. Uh, but I think that there are that specific, in, in particular for GPTs, because there's such a long diffusion timeline, um, that overlap might not be as large uh, for GPTs. So, so the, the argument that I make in the dissertation is that I focus on institutions for skill provision. Um, so um, if we take the second industrial revolution case that I ran through, uh, the standard story based on the leading sector trajectory, which emphasizes innovation, is Germany is better because it has industrial R&D labs and it has invested so much into the best scientific apparatus possible at that time. So that's why it's able to come up with leadership in chemicals. Uh, whereas actually Germany was not that good in building a chemical engineering discipline and an institution for skill building that took the principles of chemical production um, and like using chemicals um, to, in industrial processes and standardize it into what we call chemical engineering today. Um, actually, the US was much better, the first to develop chemical engineering discipline, even though the US was far behind in terms of building the scientific apparatus for um, the chemical industry. Uh, so um, I, I do think that um, the, di the dynamics that I point to in my dissertation is uh, institutions to build GPT skill infrastructure to widen the base of engineering talent rather than focus on the heroic inventors of um, new industries. Thanks. Um, let me go back to Josh now. And um, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that uh, you know there's a number of different definitions of information operations. Uh, and one of the um, participants, Jimmy Antia, uh, talks about uh, 
Have you looked at government or specifically Department of Defense definitions of uh, influence operations? And how would you distinguish your perspective, your definition from those uh, um, in sort of what, why aren't you taking sort of an off the shelf definition, so to speak, uh, uh, in uh, uh, your work? Uh, so I, I have, I actually have a slide that I'd like to share. If, uh, Can you see a slide up for the table? Yes. So, um, so I looked at a whole bunch of oh, uh, a whole bunch of different different definitions um, for both influence operations and information operations. Um, I don't think I have it here. The way that the the um, the army defines information operations relates to both the defense of one's uh, information systems and degrading an opponent's information systems, which is pretty different from the types of activities that have been considered influence operations under active measures by intelligence agencies. Um, because for example, uh, cyber attacks against um, an opponent's information systems in war aren't considered to be, they're not informational and they're uh, not influence operations in the same way as the activities that I described uh, here. So they're more like sabotage operations. Um, I do pick up from the director of the FBI covert actions by foreign governments to influence US political sentiment or public discourse. Um, so I don't exclusively use the term influence operations to refer to foreign governments. And part of the reason for that is, um, I think I described a little bit in the presentation that the types of behaviors that we see on um, social media by governments to influence uh, opinion in other countries or opinion of a target in a covert way those types of behaviors are also used by non-state actors or by organization or by um, sub-state actors. So I actually had the, the title of my uh, talk originally was Interstate Influence Operations and International Security Studies. Um, but over the last few months, I brought in my paper to look at foreign influence operations, which can target groups that are below the state level. Um, so it could target an, an individual, elites, um, certain uh, ethnic groups or subgroups of a country. And that can also be waged by groups that are not simply governments. It could be waged by businesses, um, or we also see influence operations that are run by uh, individuals within political parties as a way to get ahead of their rivals. So um, I, I have considered a bunch of different definitions. And I also pick up, as you can see, um, pieces of some of these definitions, but try to really go step by step in describing uh, each of the different components so that we can both unpack it and distinguish it from other kinds of behaviors. Thanks. Um, let me switch back to a question for uh, Jeff Ding. Um, this is from uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Darton, who's a professor at the Naval Post Graduate School. He asks, um, is your approach focused on underlying economic growth and latent power, or are you also looking at how patterns of innovation and diffusion might affect shorter term aspects of competitiveness, especially war fighting? For instance, regarding AI, should we look more at the economic payoffs from dominating the technology or at ways it might confer advantages for cyber attacks, exploiting air defense vulnerabilities and other uses on the battlefield? It's a great question. Um, I think the short answer is I am focused on the latent power component um, in terms of sustaining economic productivity growth mm -hmm. and speaking to what a lot of the leading sector uh, scholarship and scholarship in this field is talking about, um, like that Kennedy quote that I pointed to about the economic balance that will gradually then impinge upon the political and the military balance. Uh, now, I, I do, th I, I think that is sort of like the most important form of power, in my opinion. Um, economic power is fungible, and especially for US-China competition, um, China really needs productivity growth in order to sustain not only its ability to challenge the US economically, but also for performance legit legitimacy for the CCP. Um, so I think it's, it's really important, but um, I also think the GPT lens can apply to military effectiveness as well. So that's one of my working projects on how uh, GPTs like electricity also affected military power through subtle um, and gradual ways. Thanks. Um, uh, let me ask a final question for um, 
Josh. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, it's uh, allergy season. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Damon Coletta, uh, who's a professor at the US Air Force Academy asks, um, uh, when you talk about other aspects, uh, Josh, uh, of um, uh, the work you're looking at, um, how does the set of work on influence operation link to other types of um, uh, alternatives to sort of state coercion, such as privatization of war? I'm thinking uh, Damon must be referring to private military contractors. Um, he says, I suspect that both run ahead of theories of the state could it be that states try to harness these modes of wielding powers, yet in each case they run into hidden costs and limiting factors? I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I definitely think that there are similarities to consider with uh, privatizing war using private contractors, particularly in covert ways, because it could be that, and I haven't researched this comparison in depth, but just a few preliminary thoughts. Um, one, it could be that states benefit from plausible deniability in the same way um, if they use an outsourced marketing firm for a disinformation campaign as if they use um, a private contractor. And it could be that these operations are implausibly deniable so that states try to deny them even though evidence is there. Um, and there's been recent work on implausible deniability. I'm thinking of a paper by uh, Cormick and Aldrich in 2018. Um, so, so that's one area, plausible deniability. Another potential comparison, um, there could be principal agent problems in both. So um, some of my colleagues at the Stanford Internet Observatory looked at a, um, an outsourced disinformation campaign in which the marketing firm was tweeting about um, politics with political hashtags while also tweeting uh, hashtags for its business clients in order to drive up the prominence of both of the hashtags at the same time. And this could be an example where um, the, the company might have achieved the metrics that they were paid to achieve, um, but anybody seeing a tweet that has both a, you know, a, a hashtag about um, a political leader and a hashtag about uh, Dunkin' Donuts may be less likely to be persuaded by it. So I suspect that there could be principal agent problems um, across both of these types of behaviors too. Thank you. Uh, well, unfortunately, we're at the time limit, uh, and we have many more questions than we were able to uh, uh, ask and answer. Um, for those of you who I did not get to your question, if I did not get to your question, I have made note of all the questions. I'll be sharing them with Jeff and Josh. Uh, but in the meantime, please, everyone, join me in virtually thanking uh, Jeff Ding and uh, uh, Josh Goldstein for uh, sharing uh, their research with us uh, today, um, and we look forward to uh, seeing their uh, work uh, uh, as it develops uh, and published at a future date. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.